Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar for how to access state funding for bike share and micromobility. We're going to take a minute here, a minute or two, wait for folks to join on. Uh, please keep uh, your sound uh, and, and, uh, and microphones mute. Uh, and I think we have the ability to control that on our end as well. So we'll get started in a few minutes here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Linda Kamushian. I'm with the California Bicycle Coalition. I'm the senior policy advocate here based in Sacramento. And today we have uh, the ability to talk about a really exciting opportunity for communities across California to bring bike share and micromobility to their uh, neighborhoods. And we have with us Margarita Parra with Great Alternatives, who will be speaking more about uh, what the eligibility is for that and what is the, the program and what does it look like and how you can take next steps uh, to, to look at how you can apply for that, for this funding. We have a, a great uh, amount of attendees here. So we are recording this and uh, we'll make sure to have this posted and get the information to you. If you've registered, then you'll, you'll be on that list to, to get the information. Uh, and we'll um, also talk about you know, how you can uh, send in questions and then uh, and also use your chat box. Uh, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Great, so um, the next slide here is here. So our agenda is to do a quick introduction, background on the clean mobility options program and some of the advocacy efforts that we've uh, been involved with to make sure that this program is also including bikes and, and bike share for uh, communities uh, and then we'll move into the presentation with Margarita and then we'll be hosting the uh, Q&A session at the end so uh, you can send in your questions at throughout the the, the webinar uh, but we'll be looking at them and, and working through them at the end of the the presentation So just as a quick background, uh, the Clean Mobility Options uh, and is, is a program of the Low Carbon Transportation Investments. This is 
funding from the cap and trade uh, uh, surplus that has come through. What it's created is a suite of equity incentive and voucher programs to help make sure that there are uh, options for clean, clean alternatives, but also um, clean mobility across California. So this particular program um, started in the uh, fiscal year 14-15 with a small pot of funding that was really for designed to help get individuals in disadvantaged communities uh, get the mobility benefit of the automobile, so access to cars uh, without necessarily the cost burden of car ownership. Uh, and this was, you know, we know that car cars are often a, a, a very costly uh, uh, part of people's household, uh, you know. Uh, costs of, and not always have access to being able to have your own car or there's other barriers uh, and so this was a, as a way to make sure that clean cars so plug-ins hybrids uh, zero emission vehicles uh, are accessible to many communities across California and what this has transitioned to or transformed into is a program that's also looking at all kinds of mobility options. So van pools and now bike share and e-bike share and scooter share. And so it's really looking at what does the community need and at what scale, at what level. And uh, with the help of our advocacy, as well as our partners, we were able to really push the Air Resources Board to adopt within this program the ability for communities to, to uh, apply for bike and e-bike share projects. And so we'll be focusing primarily this webinar on how to really push that forward. Uh, but the entire program really does include all types of, uh, you know, both car share, van pool, bike share, scooter share. So, you know, it, it depends on what your community needs and what the project is. Uh, what we do hope to see is, is, you know, in places where bike share has not been able to expand into with the, through the private sector, uh, that this could be an option for communities to look at to bring in uh, small scale projects that can help to fill that gap. So as far as the webinar goes, um, like I mentioned, we'll, we'll, you can, you know, put your, uh, you know, put into the chat box or ask questions. Um, we'll hold responding to those questions till the end. The webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it to the website and we'll send that information to all those who've registered. And questions uh, can also be submitted after the webinar through that web page. We'll be uh, collecting them and sending them along to the administrators, uh, as well as uh, you know supporting the administrators with uh, other outreach events as well, and, and being make, making sure that the there's uh, plenty of technical assistance to access these funds. With that, I'm gonna switch it over to Margarita. And Margarita is the Clean Mobility Equity Project Lead at Grid Alternatives. She's with the, uh, the four different administrator, the administrative team for this project, uh, this program. And uh, she's also a board member of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. So she has quite a bit of insight on how this could work for uh, nonprofits and also what it means to bring uh, accessibility for biking and, and bike share to the community. So with that, I will hand it over to Margarita. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Excellent. Hi, Margarita. Uh, How are you? <laughs> I'm so great. This is such a great opportunity and a great way to start our day. Thank you, Linda, and thank you to Carl Bike uh, to invite us today. I'm just going to share my screen of my presentation um, here. Hopefully you all see it. I'm going to hide this. I'm going to go to full presentation. Um, so yes, delighted to be here as part of the administrator team. I work for Great Alternatives as um, uh, Linda mentioned, but I'm here representing uh, four organizations that are helping the state uh, implement this project and this program, and I will talk about them soon. Um, and also, I'm happy to be with you guys because I'm a bicycle advocate, as Linda mentioned, and I'm really hoping that this upcoming opportunity is used to bring bike sharing and, and also scooter sharing and other alternative transportation to our state to fulfill our climate goals. 
So maybe one thing to remember from this presentation is that we have $20 million at the Netflix in dimension, but that's the amount that we have from this program, $20 million in this window that will be available for clean mobility options. And here today, we're going to learn how to access that state funding. As Linda mentioned, this state funding uh, comes from the California Climate Investment, is our cap and trade dollars, and this uh, is money that comes through the California Air Resources Board. This is the administrative team. So the main uh, administrator is CalSTAR, uh, together with Sherry's Mobility Center and Local Government Commission and Grid Alternatives are supporting them. We're about a team of 10 people <laughs> helping in this project and, and working to ensure uh, we have um, lots of applicants and good quality of applications. So I'm going to go today to lots of beautiful pictures of bicycles, as you will see, I'm a bit biased. <laughs> uh, we're going to go through the program overview, a little bit about the process, about outreach events where you can learn more, and then we jump into Q&A. So this is the program, it's called Clean Mobility Options for Disadvantaged Communities. And as Linda said, which is very good, this is not the first round of funding. Thanks to you and other efforts uh, from CalBike, this program now is in the third round and is really specifically designed to streamline access uh, for funds for underserved communities. Uh, it was loud and clear how um, throughout the previous rounds there was a, um, a need for really concentrate on disadvantaged communities and to support small scale projects, projects like bicycle sharing. And so this, this um, tranche of money really has that objective and also build capacity to support um, all the recipients of the money to achieve their goals and to ensure the longevity of the program. I think the state really wants to ensure we uh, fulfill the climate goals that we have, but we also advance on mobility equity and also clean air, and of course help um, speed up the, the deployment of zero emission vehicles in the state. All right. What are clean mobility, I think, options? I think that's one question you may have um, and what we're talking about. Linda mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, it includes our favorite bike sharing and scooter sharing, all the active transportation options. But it also includes uh, traditional modes like car sharing and um, car pulling, van pulling, uh, on-demand transit, and some innovative transit services that are out there. I think we want to see some innovations in the field. Uh, the idea is to really have zero emission and shared options available to your communities. And as Linda mentioned too, uh, it is important that these options really answer the needs of the communities that they want to serve. And yes, you heard it right. It includes bikes, hooray, <laughs> and bike sharing with e-bikes or um, push bikes and as normal bikes. All right, so now into more of the details of the program. Um, it is a voucher program, and I want to make emphasis on this because it's a bit different to grant programs. Vouchers are so is a contract mechanism that serves as a promise of payment. Uh, vouchers are redeemed and pay uh, when their project milestones achieved. Um, so they're, they're really a reimbursement basis payment. Um, and I want to make emphasis on this because I know some people may confuse this with a grant program and, and it is a, a voucher uh, reimbursed program. Uh, we understand that some of the communities that may apply for this funding may not have the, the cash flow to access uh, and acquire some of the vehicles or bicycles um, beforehand. So the administrative team is working hard to ensure that uh, invoices from dealers or from uh, manufacturers of bicycles, for example, could actually invoice directly the administrator team. Uh, because yes, this is a voucher program. And we, we can talk more about in the Q&A. Um, and the $20 million that is uh, available uh, statewide has uh, different components. Um, one is that there's $1 million for tribal communities. This is the first time this um, source of funding is going to include tribal communities. This is also really good and is based on also advocacy done by organizations that care about equity in the state, and we're very happy. Uh, there's going to be one million for transportation needs assessments. And I want to make a pause here to explain a little bit about that because that also comes from the feedback and Linda mentioned it, that many of the advocate organizations, advocacy organizations have asked, which is we want solutions that really answer the needs of the communities. We want to ensure that there is demand for them, that it really uh, serves the gaps uh, of communities. And so there will be a requirement and there will be a, a separate amount of money, this one million, 
to do those assessments. And basically, there, there are like two or three components of them. One component is to gather data uh, that could be available through studies or through agencies who already have uh, community patterns of transportation, or we also could do surveys with the communities to get that data. So get that data from how people move to, and what are the most common destinations at the community for grocery, for commuting, for school, for health, get that information. Then engage the community meaningfully to see what are the gaps in how people move around, what are the main needs, is it, is it affordability, is it reliability, is it accessibility, what are the main needs? And then a third component after engaging the community, which is to, to arrive at the project. Why is this project going to really help with those needs uh, of this particular population and area? So that transportation needs assessment is going to be uh, a separate study. Um, we believe is, is really important and we're thankful that advocates have made emphasis on that. And one thing to mention is that up to one million is uh, the cap per, per project. It doesn't mean every project has to be one million, but uh, that's the cap, which is good. It's a substantial amount um, for a small community. So we think this, it is a good um, cap. So where are we in the timeline of this wonderful project? Uh, it did start maybe around April, uh, really when it was uh, finally awarded or, or launched. And we start working uh, through June and September in uh, engaging the stakeholders in the project design. Uh, Linda, for example, represented uh, Cal Bike at all the working group meetings and other advocates in the state, really providing good input to how this program should be designed. Now we're in October, and at the end of this month, uh, the program will be officially launched, and we will be busy doing application outreach and capacity building. We, are we really want to ensure that all the state uh, eligible applicants know about this and really use this opportunity and access this funding. We are going to be conducting nine regional forums, and I'll mention the locations later, uh, five webinars or maybe more. And this is the first one, so you guys are the lucky ones who hear this for the first time. And um, we are going to be engaging in technical assistance, which we know is one of the barriers for smaller communities to access funding. We really want to help uh, them uh, solve all the questions on the applications, all the requirements to make sure that we have good applicants from those communities. Um, in February 2020, we have the first uh, funding, um, the first window of funding available uh, opens. This is tentative. We still don't know exactly when, but um, we expect something around February 2020. And the way this will work is as other programs at the state in a first come, first serve. And there will be other subsequent um, windows of funding um, that we know. Uh, maybe there will be one after six or nine months, uh, still to be determined. We will are going to learn soon and we're going to pass that information but we're here in the october which is the, uh, the october january frame which is we're trying to do most outreach possible about this program all right so who can participate and uh excuse us this is the most uh, difficult slide with the most information but i'm going to try to um share it and, and what it is so this program, as we said, it was designed for disadvantaged communities. And, and the indicator that we use is the Cal Environment Screen 3.0. And disadvantaged communities are defined as the 75th percentile of, of, of those communities on the Environment Screen. Uh, those are communities who suffer the highest burden of pollution in the state, which is really good because we know they really need alternative transportation options that are now based on gasoline and diesel. And those, this is why they are the main target of this funding. Uh, you can see those in the pink colors in the map on your right. We also have another eligible uh, applicants who are the solar and multifamily affordable housing SOMA. These are affordable housing uh, properties uh, that are within the AB50 low-income communities. And that is, is a legislation that defines um, low-income communities. And I believe it's about 80% or below the statewide uh, median income. Um, and we also include tribal lands, as we said, this is uh, the new, and um, just before the, the, the SOMA ones are the little blue uh, circles. And you can see we have a lot of those throughout the state. And the last uh, component of the eligible areas are the tribal lands, also within AB 1550 and uh, disadvantaged communities. And those are the red uh, little squares that you can see throughout. 
um, I know this may be daunting to see and to just look at now, maybe you're really getting very close to the, to the screen to see if your community is eligible. We want to say that as administrators, we're going to help uh, figuring that out. We may create some, a list or a tool just to make sure that you know where your community is so we can answer questions through email. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And to, to the end of the Q&A also, we can answer questions. All right, so who can apply for funding? The question we were waiting for. Um, eligible applicants are public agencies and nonprofit organizations. So I know some of you, most of you represent nonprofit organizations, so you are eligible applicants. And we really want to promote partnerships. I know this is an area where maybe some of the bicycle coalitions are really known for working with the public agencies, with their city government, with the county government, and we want to actually, yeah, we, we want to really encourage that. At the same time, we really want to encourage uh, partnerships with CBOs, community-based organizations, with mobility providers, for example, uh, companies like Uber, Jump, or Lyft, who provide that service, and also partnerships with the infrastructure providers. This is in the case of uh, electric um, equipment that is needed for charging. Um, vehicles in the case of vehicles, but also in the case of bicycles, uh, whatever is necessary for, uh, you know, for the bike share to work. Um, and there may be companies who specialize in that, and we want to uh, make sure that there are partnerships, um, there form partnerships to, to, to apply. Um, public agencies can apply once, except in the case where there is an unincorporated area, and, and then that county can actually represent more uh, up to three communities but nonprofit organizations can only be um, submitting one application. The sub-applicants, like the operators and CBOs, they can be, if they're sub-applicants, they can be in multiple applications because they're, they're not the main applicants. All right, what are the eligible costs? Can, what can you put in that $1 million? Uh, so it is included the capital equipment, so the, the cost of the vehicles, the bicycles, the scooters, and everything to do with the charging, charging infrastructure of those vehicles. Um, in this case, for example, for bicycles, all the bicycle parking infrastructure that we need will be included there. Also, operation costs. And this is very important because in the model that maybe companies like Uber, Jump, uh, uh, and Lyft already have bicycles, we know what we need is the operation in our community. So we are not really requiring them to buy the bicycles because they have them. And in that case, this funding can be available for covering this operation cost. And outreach cost, which is really important. We want to ensure that community is engaged, that the community was consulted through the transportation assessment of their needs. Um, and we want to make sure that they continue to be engaged throughout the, the, the implementation of the, of the project and the users of this project. So that's why those costs, like marketing outreach, all of that will be covered through in the voucher. All right, so now that if you have a look of what, this is like what you will see in the um, application requirements. And I wanted to show it today because I think it's important that you have a sense of what is on this application. And if you have questions, and at the end there will be, of course, materials being published at CARB websites and our upcoming website. But at least you have uh, yeah, an idea what how difficult will be, which we are hoping not too difficult because we are making it a uh, streamlined. So it will be a project narrative the transportation needs assessment, the project area profile, the site infrastructure and needs profile, what is the area where we need to put our bicycle share parking, for example, what is required there. We want to have a financial sustainability plan. Uh, the voucher is supposed to uh, be for two years. Um, I think that's the, the, the funding that is available for two years of operations, but we want to make sure that the service lasts at least for four years. Um, so in this financial sustainability plan, we'll be showing how uh, the income from the state and the income, for, like the different contributions that we can expect, um, will make sure that this um, service will continue to operate for four years. There will be a team profile, uh, all the estimated costs, of course, the community outreach plan, and letters of commitment. Uh, this is important because we know that uh, what we want to do is that in the case that uh, there is a public agency as an applicant, we want to ensure that they have a letter of commitment of CBOs and NGOs in that area to ensure that there really is buy-in from the community. And likewise, if um, on the other hand, if uh, uh, there's a community that is applying for this, uh, a CBO or an NGO, we want to make sure that they have the, the support of the city and the local government 
to ensure that they have the permits that this will require, that they really have you know, really the backing of the, of the local government. So those letters of commitment are going to be very important. So as you see, there's some, some requirements, but we think those are uh, really something that um, NGOs like yourselves are able to put together for an application or in a partnership with a local uh, a public agency. And finally, outreach events, um, which is the fun thing we're doing. Um, so the first <laughs> outreach event that we're doing, and you guys are very lucky because we took the, the bicycle and the bicyclists first, I'm going to go to the Cal Bike Summit next week. Uh, which is great. I, I can't wait for uh, seeing all those bicycle advocates and I'll be together. On October 16, we had the opportunity to present to the main plenary again this program, maybe going into some other details. And we have, uh, as I mentioned, nine outreach forums in different communities. Uh, we have one in Los Angeles and San Diego, Riverside City, and these are the dates. Uh, we're also going to Fresno, Bakersfield, Stockton. Uh, for the Central Valley. Uh, we're going to go to Auckland. Um, and then we're having two forums at two tribal uh, places. One is in Blue Lake Rancheria and the other one is in Pechanga. And we're really hoping there to bring um, eligible applicants and to explain more in detail how to fulfill and how to fill all the application requirements, um, how to solve all the questions about the different components of this um, program. And also maybe even be on the same page about uh, opportunities for uh, partnerships, for example, how to make a good partnership with a mobility provider, how to make sure we assess well the needs for infrastructure, uh, what permits are required. Like we want to ensure those forums really get into the details to help the, the applicants to further the application. And we also have more webinars. Uh, we are going to be um, trying to reach different audiences like yourselves. We are going to talk to the affordable housing sector uh, through a webinar that will be specific about how we make this real there. Uh, we are also talking to other funders in the state, uh, other foundations that may be interested on in supporting some of the NGOs, you know, foundations such as the one I used to work, <laughs> like the Hewlett Foundation, to chime in in here because I think this is an effort that is uh, really important and, and should be um, uh, you know, should be leveraged uh, to really get to the state goals and the social goals that we have. Well, that's it. And here I wanted to mention um, the, the, our contact details us now. We're working on a website uh, that will be upcoming. Uh, but for now, we have this phone line and the, our generic uh, email, info at cleanmobilityoptions.org. And I put my email, uh, mparra at gridalternatives.org. And my colleague, who I hope is also listening and has been a great help, uh, especially getting those maps of eligibility for everybody, Logan Deer, and her email is ldeer at gridalternatives.org. But also the whole team, I'm sure, is able to answer questions as the two of us um, as a starting point. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Margarita. That was a great overview. And really this, this webinar was intended to just get people introduced to this program. What are some of the main eligibility areas so that they can go, you know, you can go back and, and start to either brainstorm or if there's already projects you already have in mind that would be eligible. So it's really just to introduce this concept and, and this project, uh, this program so that we can, uh, you know, get the information out there and start working with communities to, to develop their application. So uh, we can just jump right in. We have some questions already. And since we have enough time left over, uh, if you want to talk, if you want to speak up, uh, we, you can raise your hand and then we can uh, uh, open up your, your mic uh, so you can jump in and we can talk live. So. We'll just jump in with the questions we have. So if, uh, if we have an existing bike share program, would we be eligible to participate in this program? That's a good question. Yes, expansions are allowed. Uh, so you'll be able to um, make an expansion to a new area. Um, maybe the question will be if you receive funding from the state, from the same program, uh, which maybe I'm assuming no, because we didn't have any other programs with that. Uh, that may be uh, more tricky, but since you didn't receive any funding from the state, I think any expansion is actually acceptable and eligible. Great, and then more on eligibility. What if you are a nonprofit that organizes in two geographically different areas, such as Northern and Southern California? 
Yes, that was a race in, the, in, in, in a previous meeting. And I think in that case, if it's two different communities, I think the criteria that we have for uh, local governments like a county that can oversee different unincorporated areas, that will also apply for this nonprofit. If it's really serving two different communities, uh, I think those, they will be able to apply as well twice. And I, I just wanted to mention, I have some colleagues on the line from my team. I don't know if in case they also want to chime in. I, I'm happy for them to, uh, as well, in case I don't have all the answers. <laughs> from yeah, that's question. a great point. If anyone wanted, wants to add anything to the information. They can maybe uh, raise their hand to, or send me a text. <laughs> and I can okay. unmute them. Someone actually is asking who receives emails that are sent to info at cleanmobilityoptions.org. Is that, Margarita, is that a, a good place for people to send their yes. questions as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the best place. We are going to be reading this constantly. Uh, that email is going to be our main uh, way of contacting uh, and hearing from you. So we're happy. Uh, I think we have a team of people dedicated, CalStar, which is the main prime, as I mentioned, uh, is our gate. But those emails and, and phone calls as well, we put the phone call, are going to be distributed to the whole team. Okay. Because Cameron Gray uh, has mentioned he's sent some messages, but, uh, you know, it's probably... We, they're, they just wrapped up with the workshop, so I think there's more information now. Um, so Cameron, will, they hope to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, if you wanted to add anything, Cameron, to the questions here, feel free to do that. So we'll move on. Uh, what does it mean by it being a voucher program? Uh, yes, and this is what I took some time to explain. Um, that um, this is a different uh, type of programs that that grants program. Um, the state, uh, given their fiscal responsibility with our taxpayer money, in this case the, the cap and trade money, can only provide funding via reimbursement. Um, so in this case, a voucher is a promise of payment. Once the project and the, and, and the application is uh, approved, uh, there will be issue a voucher and that voucher will be redeemed. Uh, I think the period is about nine months and this are our tentative until the program is finalized. And during those nine months, uh, the organization should be able to invoice either, as I mentioned, this, um, the administrator directly to um, or through their dealers or, or, or other um, intermediaries that may be providing these uh, vehicles, uh, they could invoice um, the administrator team, CalStar directly, to receive their funding. So it's a different mechanism, but this is the way the, the money from the state works. And, and the idea being that this is a, a way to manage the, 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 stream, the streamlining aspect of the program, right? So, uh, so that there's, and then also projects are going to be on different timelines, you know, um, so it's just to, to get that funding moved through more quickly. Exactly. That's a good point. If it was reimbursed through the state, it would take forever. So we're lucky that we have the administrator. I think as Sam uh, Gregor said in the last working group meeting, the funding is already with CalSTAR. So a really much faster way to get the funding. Right. Okay, I have great. one, one yeah, okay. other answer for the previous question that I got from my colleague. Uh, for the uh, expansion of existing services, as I say, they actually are eligible, but they have a cap that is actually less than the one million. And we believe it's 600,000, but um, the good news is that expansions of existing services are eligible. Uh, it's only that maybe the, the, the dollar amount will be uh, lower. And again, these questions, we can give you uh, definite answers at, at the end of the month when we have the, the finalization and the launching of the program. Great, thank you. And um, I mean, picking back off the voucher question, does the fund, do the funds, uh, does the program allow for advances? So getting advanced, into advanced funds. No, I, 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 I don't believe so because it only works on a reimbursement basis. Um, so I don't think there could be advances uh, be made. Right. Um, but one thing that I'm working on, which is uh, because I used to work at a foundation in particular, uh, this is why I'm going to do a webinar with foundations uh, in about uh, in less than two weeks. And the idea is that philanthropic resources can help in the case of nonprofit applications, uh, because we know that foundations um, do provide 
general operating support or sometimes program support to NGOs. And that is always in the money that they can have in advance. So uh, we're trying to find ways that, that we can um, go over that barrier. Yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, the administrators are working to make sure uh, that you know, the administrators are invoiced directly. So from, from the vendors. So there does, you know, there's this opportunity where the, either the nonprofit or the public entity or they're not paying directly. It's just being invoiced. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. And um, my friend Ryan just mentioned to me that uh, the invoices that CalStar will receive has to be for amounts of over $10,000. So capital equipment, you know, vehicles, bicycles, all those uh, big, um, big costs that the organizations cannot bear. Uh, they can send the invoice directly to um, CalStar, and it may be that a manufacturer, a provider, uh, invoices directly on, on behalf of the organization, so that the organization doesn't have to put any money on those big costs. And uh, also with that, there's another question. Do operation costs include not just the bike share operator, but staff costs? Correct. Yes, the voucher can uh, um, reimburse operation costs, which is uh, personal time, you know, all the indirect costs that running such a services will require. Great. Can councils of governments, COGS, submit an application for a program that applies to multiple cities and or unincorporated communities? That's a good question, and so they can, yes, apply, uh, but I think up to three sites per local government or county government, in this case, the council of governments. Um, I think they're allowed to have three different projects as maximum. Right, and that's so that unincorporated communities have an opportunity to have a applicant support their project. That's right. Exactly. And this is to allow that there are multiple applications throughout the state as we saw the big map. There are a lot of communities who are eligible, so we want to make sure that there is a diversity of, of, of applications from all the regions in the state. And then our churches, uh, with no alternative transportation available, can they apply as well as a nonprofit, I suppose? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I think one of our um, forums is going to be at a church in San Diego, if I'm uh, not mistaken. I think we heard yesterday a confirmation. So absolutely. And we think that, uh, um, you know, places and, and community groups and, and CBOs who really are close to their communities are great because they're going to be able to bring people, uh, you know, um, to, to use this, to, to have more information. I think it's great that churches are involved. Great, so let's see. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, outreach. Um, someone asked if this will, if there's gonna be anything at the ATP symposium at the end of this month. Uh, Margarita, I don't know if you've been involved with that, but. Uh, That's a question I cannot answer. Uh, we just, uh, I don't have the information. I think I heard about this um, symposium, but uh, I'm not sure if one of my colleagues may be planning to go, so maybe, Maybe I get back to the person who answered the question, if you can let me know who it is, or maybe send Sure. Uh, and also, um, I can help with uh, making sure there's some available information there. That's a great forum, so thanks for, um, to Robert Moser for that suggestion. Yes, and, then, and um, this is actually a good point. If you have any suggestions of where else should be uh, including this information, we're happy to. We're just studying, and I think it's great to hear suggestions about other um, venues, conferences, and other webinars that we can make to reach out to most people. You also the locations of our of our forums. Uh, once we have, um, we're going to start sending the invitations, and you should feel free. Uh, you are included in the mailing list now, but if you, you should feel free to forward the invitation to other people you think will benefit to attending those webinars on those locations. And there's another one, since we know those are only nine geographic locations, we're also going to host a webinar um, that will go through all the contents that the forums do, and it will be available for everybody who, want, who wants to participate who couldn't attend the in-person forums. Yes, we're getting some suggestions from some of the attendees already, so we'll definitely uh, get those to you, Margarita. Uh, 
let's see here. So someone did ask about the Fresno Forum. Is that scheduled? And is there a location for that? Or you guys will have that available? Oh, well, that's a great question. And I know my colleague Grace may be on the line too. We would love to be in Fresno and soon. We're actually just going through the research of, of venues. So if the person who suggests that has a venue in mind, we would like to hear it because we've been, I think, contacting different venues. I think we're in this process. So it's on the right time um, to give us a suggestion of where to go in Fresno. Excellent. Uh, so if an existing transit agency is set up as a GPA serving two municipalities, would they be eligible? JPA, I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, they will be eligible. It will be the same criteria that we mentioned originally that one uh, public agency can support up to three applications. So in that case, a transit agency can submit the two counties that it serves. If a city has disadvantaged communities but is not entirely considered a disadvantaged community, do they need to restrict the project scope just to the, the DAC or is there some threshold like a majority of the project area? No, that's also a good question. Uh, so the funding is intended for disadvantaged communities. Uh, but there is, a, of course, an understanding that people in, in an area go to another area, right, for shopping, for school. So we are allowing, uh, the state is allowing up to 20% of the infrastructure of, a, of, of one project to be located outside the DAC, outside the disadvantaged area. But th that city that has both disadvantaged and not disadvantaged areas can apply for that funding, providing most of the, of the project funding, the 80% goes to the disadvantaged area. And, and all that will be in addition to the sort of the maps, the interactive maps will be listed out so that it's very clear. Correct. And we, we were learning, yes, as you guys saw, the, 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 the map is quite <laughs> comprehensive and it has a lot of little dots for the summer, for example, summer properties. So we really want to make sure that we find a tool um, and maybe we're thinking maybe it's just as, as, as simple as a list of all the communities that we were actually discussing yesterday that with the team, or we can maybe find out another way to show. The map is, is available right now, um, but it has to be, of course, uh, accurate with all the information that is needed. But um, as we develop this, if people have questions, uh, feel free to send us an email and we can answer that. Right, so the map is available, but someone had asked if there's an interactive version, which is, which is not yeah. the same. Well, uh, and my colleague Logan is the one who's been developing the map with GIS. Um, so the map exists. Uh, it's actually online and I learned yesterday that you don't need to have a, a GIS account. It's free. So the map exists on, on the web. However, it may not be completely accurate because there is still fine tuning to do. So while maybe that's one resource that we can pass on, um, it, it's better to double check to ensure that you know all the pixels are actually accurate. <laughs> Great. So, is there an ideal size geographically and financially? And I, I, maybe this means also that the project size or the scope. If there's an ideal project size, yeah. Know. It just says, is there an, any ideal size geographically and financially? So, do people want to? Go for the one million dollars. Do we want? You know, what's the sort of yeah. intended and scope? That is good, and we know that through our interactions with people, of course, when we see a one million, we want the whole one million <laughs> uh, because it's really appealing. A, a but the truth is, I think the ideal project, the, the right question, the right answer is the ideal project is the one that really serves the needs of that community. Um, so it could be a small project that really serves. Um, the needs for uh, for the residents and just to, to to give you an example we have uh, in the previous round in, rounds of funding and also from other agencies funding we have projects that are very small uh, maybe you all heard about green right theaters which is a project in central valley in the city of huron uh, who only had two initially two vans and it was just a van pulling uh, in spanish right there is, is the word that comes from 
get a ride. Um, is, ride is the, it became the Spanish Riteros and green Riteros because it, of, of course, works on, on zero emission vehicles. It was a small project, a small scale project, but it really had solved the needs for um, going to access healthcare to many residents of that city. So um, the ideal project really is uh, what serves the, the community needs of the, of the project. I think that's a great answer because in your project application, you'll have to demonstrate need uh, and in whether that's uh, meetings that have happened with the community or some format, if it's in a plan, if the bike, you know, if it's been, it, somehow it's been vetted by the community, right? Yes, exactly. That and in, in that in the previous rounds of funding, uh, the the needs assessment wasn't required, but the smaller projects actually were really um, more in tune to be closer to their communities. And that's why going forward, we really want to make sure that the transportation needs assessments have this uh, meaningful community engagement. Okay, great. And on that sort of one million dollar, is that a cap per project for one year or for two years? If only. If for one year, can you apply and receive another $1 million for the second year? Uh, well, there will be more rounds of funding, but once you get uh, an application and that is approved, it will be for that amount. <laughs> so if you apply for the $1 million, that will be the $1 million for, I think, up to three years, what I hear from my colleague, Ryan, I think it's two or three years funding that you can use that uh, voucher. Um, you should redeem it before, but that should be... Um, should be last for at least up to two or three years. Uh, but then there will be other uh, windows of funding, uh, but I will believe that people who receive the funding and through this uh, windows uh, may know, may have to uh, give space for new applications and new, uh, and new uh, projects um, for other applicants. Yeah, and I think that's a good question just to clarify to uh, what does the sustainability of your project look like? Uh, you do have to demonstrate um, sort of ongoing yes, yes. support. And, and I got a reminder as well from my colleague Ryan who's texting me that I think this is a uh, one thing that I haven't maybe I said but I want to emphasize um, before I talked about the sustainability uh, is that it's in a first uh, come first serve. Uh, I don't know if um, I didn't mention it before, but the state through that window and through the window that we are going to open in in February will receive all the applications and it will be that um, timestamp which is the the way those applications are, um, you know, assessed currently. Um, uh, there are, of course, pros and cons about different ways to assess applications. Uh, I think that this is, we want to ensure equity, and I think this timestamp is one that has worked uh, in the past, and we hope um, it continue to work. Um, and we want to make sure everybody has the same elements to be ready when the time comes. Um, now, in terms of, uh, of the sustainability, and this is a, a very good point because we know um, the money that is available uh, from this voucher, uh, of course, is not all the cost that this project will have. Right? Of course, we try to cover all the capital costs, operation costs, outreach costs, but it will require some contributions uh, from um, maybe existing projects or some of the NGOs budgets or some of the other, as I was mentioning, philanthropic organizations that can be chime in or other government funding that is not from the clean transportation funding because that cannot count as a contribution. Um, so what we want to see is that the, applic the applicant has done the exercise to really look at um, how this project will continue to operate after the funding from this voucher will expire, like um, a combination through the maybe the, the income that it receives through the through the service, uh, other sources of funding, how it can continue to operate um, and, and be um, for for longer years in service, not the longevity that we were talking in initially. So that's what the sustainability plan will look like, and we're hoping to give some. Um, some uh, more uh, resources and that will be part of the administrator team's toolkit for technical assistance. We will be uh, providing, uh, you know, templates or guidelines of how to produce that sustainability plan. Great, thank you. So we have a uh, number of questions still left, but we have some time, so we'll just keep going along. So can any of the funds be used to develop plans or research vendors and types of programs? Uh, or does that kind of research need to be funded in the needs assessment? Yes, yeah, so the research that you will need will be part of the needs assessment. 
um, the transportation needs assessment. And there is a great case that was actually developed by Transform here in the Bay Area where I live. Uh, and maybe they have some materials online. We just learned about their experience last week um, where they actually did some service to the community. Uh, we're not talking about academic research, right? We're talking really about we want to learn what are the community uh, and the commute pa uh, patterns, uh, where people go, what distances, what do they use, what do they use public transit, do they use a car, like all that research about how people move around that community um, to find out what their main gaps are. That's something that can be done definitely with a transportation needs assessment voucher. And I should mention that that one has a cap of $50,000. Um, you guys remember at the beginning, I said there's a total pot of one million for those assessments. And I think per project, the cap is at fifty thousand dollars for the applicants to do that. that okay, great. And by first come first serve, do you mean that the first project submitted, which meet the minimum requirements, will be awarded funding? If demand is high, will projects be awarded partial funding? Oh, that's just one of the difficult questions to answer. So the first part is yes, it's the first come, first serve. Um, it's a timestamp. Um, of course, uh, granted, the, uh, all the projects are uh, fulfill the eligible criteria. Uh, we're hoping, if we are over the month, we're hoping that there will be more um, windows of funding that can be awarded later. Uh, but I don't think we can have, uh, award partial funding I don't think that's been uh, considered. What would be considered is having that, um, having those projects who are not being able to get more funding this time, uh, get maybe in the line to get to the second window that we heard is going to be open and subsequent windows that we hope um, the board of, of, of CAR continues to approve for this program. That's right. And, and that's why this is very important for Cal Bike to make sure that uh, you know, folks in our network and um, city governments who uh, that have been wanting to bring bike share but haven't been that attractive for private investment, private private uh, bike share and scooter share, uh, for whatever reason, uh, have the opportunity to look at what projects can be brought to their to their community. So it's it's pretty critical to make sure that you know you. You meet the eligibility requirements and you get the project um, application in as soon as possible because, as Margarita mentioned, it's time stamped. Correct. Uh, okay, so with, with also that, what is the timeline for processing the application? Oh, that's a good question, and I'm sure uh, <laughs> this is on us, the administrator team, but we're hoping to do really a fast turnaround. Um, I think we, as an administrator team, uh, because we're going to be involved in technical assistance, uh, we're going to uh, be sensing on uh, having a, a view of how many projects are in the pipeline, who is interested, you know, through our communications with the, with the stakeholders and through our forums and through all of that. We're going to know, we're hoping that, yeah, once that the, the window is open, which is going to be open for a month, we will uh, turn those applications quickly and review them quickly and provide, of course, um, this information to CARP, who makes the ultimate decision. But we will process them as soon as we can. <laughs> Great. And uh, we have quite a few more questions here. We'll try and get through as much as we can. Uh, let's see. Would funded projects in the AB 1550 low-income areas need to be physically located in the SOMA property, or do they just need to serve SOMA-eligible residents in these AB 1550 low-income areas? Um, so that the answer to that question will be similar to a, um, a previous one about where people need to be. I think th the intent will be for a SOMA property within the AB 1550 to have the majority of the benefit, that's the 80% of the, of the infrastructure should be there, but 20% could be uh, outside that SOMA um, property. Uh, of course, provided it's between the AB 1550. Um, we understand people need to have, for example, especially on bike sharing, we need different bike stations to put our bikes, right? So we know that maybe we have to locate some of the bike sharing stations outside uh, that some property outside the, the area. So it is understand, isn't that it's understood that that could happen? But again, I think we have to ensure that um, that really benefits the, the communities of, of that SOMA facility and no other residents, maybe from no a disadvantaged area. Great. And uh, 
What about local bus systems and schools and maybe the Chamber of Commerce or police force? Are these, elig are these eligible entities? Uh, so one uh, important um, uh, criteria is that we're not, uh, this program doesn't include buses as such, like um, zero emission buses. There are other programs to buy uh, and to uh, put in service uh, zero emission buses. Here, this program only includes um, medium-sized vehicles like van pools and, and of course, car sharing, uh, and now for us, bike sharing. Um, but a school district could apply if they want to do a smaller scale project, if they want to maybe put some bicycles <laughs> in their schools, that would be so good. Uh, so yeah, so school districts, uh, chambers of commerce, all this can apply, but I think the caveat is that this funding is only for um, certain types of vehicles and it doesn't include buses. Right. So uh, as when it comes to minimum operating experience, is there anything required for the mobility operator or the city agency? I think that was discussed um, at the first working group meeting and I believe it's one year of experience and I'm maybe waiting if I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken in this, if Brian is there, because I think it's one year of experience that uh, uh, um, will be in register uh, that the mobility providers um, should operate. And, and while I get confirmation of that one year, I wanted to mention that um, the administrator team uh, provide, uh, did something called the Mobility Providers Directory, um, which is a compiled list of all the mobility providers who uh, fulfill some requirements. There's a minimal uh, eligible criteria for them to, to be part of that directory and is to ensure that they are going to be good providers of those services. Uh, that information is public uh, and so you you can see through the information who are the best uh, mobility providers who can be uh, good for your area or which ones have good experience who have been longer in those areas serving disadvantaged communities or have more experience doing so. Um, but I do believe there is a, a requirement for about a year and I can maybe double check uh, if I'm mistaken. That, that's right. I, that's what I believe was discussed in the workshops. So yeah. Uh, but definitely something you'll know when you're going to coordinate your team of uh, operators and applicants. Uh, so when you say sites, I think uh, this was in reference to when you showed the map that corresponds to the blue and red polygons on that map. So I believe that's that's right. It's the, those are areas where uh, the disadvantaged communities, and we'll go to that screen. Yes. This one. Yes. So the question is, when you say sites, does that correspond to the blue and red polygons on the map? Yes. Yeah, so the sites could be, uh, will be the intersection of all of those. So it could be, um, and maybe, I don't know if you guys see my, for example, this is a tribal area, this red dot. Uh, so the site could be this tribal area because it's within an AB1550 tribal land. Um, or for example, all these areas here who are pink and disadvantaged communities. That is also another site areas. Uh, the blue dots, as I mentioned, are the SOMA, the solar uh, in multi affordable housing. And there are so many of them, of course, because we have many of those in the state. And they're, so if they're within the AB50 and DAX, of course, they can apply. And I actually have some information. Colleague Logan said that we could um, send this map to people who are interested, the GIS map that is available now with the caveat that I mentioned, but we're, we're, if there is uh, somebody we can send, somebody who is interested, we can send that interactive map by request. Okay, great. And if, if cities' jurisdictions require permits, does the voucher cover permit costs for mobility operators? I believe so. And one of the things that um, that is important is when you're sending your application, you as preparing your application, you have to know all the permits that you need because uh, as we all know, and we work in this area, permits can take a long time. And, and we want to ensure that in the planning, we know uh, the authorities that we need to reach and, and you know the, the procedures to get those permits. Uh, we've been hearing in the working groups that you know sometimes um, charging infrastructure could go from six to nine months. So um, uh, it's important that um, that we know how much time, but I think I just get the confirmation that absolutely, yes, <laughs> the, the, the permit costs are included in the voucher. So, uh, Margarita, when do you think the grant guidelines, the application guidelines will be available for people to view online? 
No, oh, I knew this question will come. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so we're hoping that. Um, so at the end of the month, the first part of the, because we're going to launch the program, the program will be launched by CARP. Uh, some of these materials will be online in our website. Um, I think the, the publication of the final documents will be upcoming in November. Uh, you know, the implementation manual is like a huge book. <laughs> but I think we, what we're going to do, and, and this is part of our administration's role, is to provide those templates and those kind of guidelines who are more easily uh, available and easily to read. And those, I think, uh, after the end of the month, you will see those online. And we can just keep you posted um, uh, about when this is going to be launched. But we're hoping just at the end of the month, in November, early November, you will have access to the minimum information that is required. And that website is the cleanmobilityoptions.org, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, great. Well, we are at time and we have a number of questions still uh, oh, wow. <laughs> pending, but I, we'll go ahead and, and reach out to those folks directly. We have your question and we have your contact. And I want to thank Margarita for being available and to the whole administrator team, CalSTAR, Shared Use Mobility Center, uh, and uh, Local Government uh, Commission for their work in bringing this together. It is a short time line in from now to when the application window opens and making sure you get your, your application in. Uh, but we want to make sure that you have all the tools you need to help uh, help move it forward and get this funding uh, out to your community. So we'll definitely be following up uh, with the recording as well as the slides and uh, a list of the questions so, and answers so that you guys have that available. So thank you so much for your attention and your time. And thank you again, Margarita, for your uh, great information and, and for those who've been helping you on the other end, <laughs> Brian and, and Grace and Logan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alin. That's Thank a pleasure. You. And yes, thanks to my colleagues for being with me uh, online. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.